Well, praise the Lord, brothers. This is Pastor Patrick Harvey. I want to thank y'all for joining us on this Friday night for our men's Bible study. Um, it is time for Man Up Bible study. I'm excited to be able to share the word of God with you guys tonight. And uh, we're going to have a good time in the Lord. All right. I know we missed you last week. Thank God for all of you all and um, bearing with us as we spent some time um, with the family. Amen. And um, going through some things. We thank God for his grace um, that has sustained us. Amen. All right. So once you go ahead and, and share Bible study, fellas, and let's get ready to get into the word of God. Um, got an excellent teaching tonight. Um, I'm excited about it. Last time we got together, we talked about what a wife is and what a wife isn't. And I know some of the things that came out of that um, should have made us really reflect on um, what we've been looking for and what we've been expecting. And I'm going to go back through some of that tonight just for a few minutes as a point of reference. Um, but then from there, we're going to move forward in our teaching as we continue um, talking about women tonight. We're going to be talking about um, the woman that God has for you. Now, not the woman he has for me, but the woman that God has for you. All right. Let's get ready to go into the word of God and let's start with the word of prayer. And we will we will see you guys. I see you guys coming in now. Thank you. Let's go ahead and share it on your timeline. For those of you that are already in, let's let everybody know we're in Bible study. Amen. As brothers tonight. Amen. As a matter of fact, let's take a quick moment and, and um, greet each other and um, let each other know that we're out there in virtual land. Amen. All right, brothers. I see y'all. God bless y'all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for those brothers that are already out there. Thank you for the words you put in my heart to share tonight, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for the men that you would give us wisdom, that you would help us be the men of God that you called us to be. Make teaching easy tonight, Lord God. Make it plain that we can understand um, the lesson tonight, that we will leave here better as men, as husbands, as providers, as mentors, as counselors, Lord God, as leaders as influencers tonight. We bless you for the spirit of God. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we bless you for what you desire to say tonight. Have your way in us and through us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, brother Tony, man, bless you, sir. Bless you, sir. Good to have you with us tonight. Amen. All right. So let's get into the word tonight. Um, last week, we not last week, the last time we were together, brother Darren, bless you, man. Uh, we were together, we talked about what a wife isn't. And we talked about the fact that God does not desire for man to be alone. And it's in our loneliness sometimes that we make poor decisions. And we're going to feed off of that tonight as we get into the word. Um, men are called to work until the Lord provides. Notice that in the word of God, we talked about Adam was given his assignment. And as he was working, the Lord provided for him a help mate. Help me, help me. Good Lord Almighty, Patrick Harvey. God provided for him a help me. So if you're not doing your assignment, if you're not working, then why do you need to help me? God always provides for someone for us that we accomplish the will of God. And that's going to be very important tonight um, as we go through the lesson. Okay, y'all keep that in mind. Now, let's keep going. We're just kind of quickly skimming um, our study notes from last week. One of the other things we talked about in order for us to understand what a wife is, we must know what God's design for a wife is from the book of Genesis. And we walk through that. We also talked about a wife is God's gift to the man. She's a helper for the man in the earth. She's God's ordained lover for the man. Yes, there's a God ordained lover. And then you can just go get somebody to lust with. Amen. But God's ordained lover for the man is his wife. Amen. Um, she is a crown for the husband. Amen. She is God's ordained companion and intercessor um, in a marriage covenant. Amen. Now, there are other times that we have relationships with other people that we may not be married to, but there's a certain threshold we don't cross unless we're married. Amen. Amen. Um, 
and she is to be sought after. Yes, let me say that again. Um, a wife is to be sought after. Brothers, all us out there sitting around waiting for us to drop in our laps. That's not what scripture says. Um, let's go to it. Let's go over to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. And we're going to fix our attention on verse number 22. Very familiar verse in the Bible. Proverbs 18 and 22. Listen to what God's word says. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtain a favor of the Lord. So God says when you find a wife, you also find favor. You obtain favor from him. And your wife is to be a good thing. Okay. So that was what we talked about last week. And, you know, a lot of brothers will pass them. Well, man, I'm not married. So what about me? So you're saying that the only person that can have that kind of relationship um, to have a companion um, is someone that's married. That's not what I'm saying. Because the reality is if we don't learn to have healthy relationships before we get married, we will have jacked up marriages when we do get married. OK, you're, you're not going to have um, crazy uh, relationships while you're single and all of a sudden jump up one day and all of a sudden you just have this perfect marriage. It doesn't work that way. We have to learn. We have to prepare. God has to develop us as men so that we can be the, the man that he called us to be. And we can receive our bride when he presents her to us. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk from the topic. And I do have study notes. Um, matter of fact, let me go ahead and just take a quick second. And uh, let me go ahead and post those for y'all. Praise God. All right. Give me, bear with me, brothers. It's been a long day today. Hallelujah. But God is still good. Amen. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is the woman that God has for you. Now, I want to caution y'all. I'm not only talking to those that are single. I'm also talking to those that are already married. Because listen to, listen to me carefully and catch what I'm saying. The woman you're with now, I'm not telling you to divorce her. I'm not telling you to put her away. I'm simply telling you there's more in her than you've realized. There's more in your wife than you've experienced. The woman you're looking to date, um, there's a certain there's certain things that God has for you. And so I'm talking to the single, but I'm also talking to the married. I don't know about you, but the woman I married is not the woman I'm married to today. Glory to God. I mean, I loved her then, but my God, I love her now even that much more because I've seen how God has cultivated and developed her. And the truth can be said, you ought not want to be the husband you were when you first got married. Amen. There ought to be some growth in you. Um, we grow from we go from grace to grace, from faith to faith. Amen. So the woman that you often meet at the altar may not be the woman you wake up with. Um, same lady, same last name, social security number, everything else. But that may not be the woman you wake up in the morning with 20 years later. Because God wants her to become all that he planned for her to be. And as you grow, she should be grown. As you develop, she should be developing. And so it is that much more in marriage, but also when you're single. Um, there is a certain woman that God has for you. I know a lot of us, when we, were out, when we were younger and we were single and we were just players. But the reality is God has a woman that he has perfectly designed to help you accomplish everything that he has put in front of you. Amen. There is a woman that God has for you. And your goal in life as a man ought to not settle for anything less than that woman. If you're already married, you ought not settle for anything less than that your bride becoming all that God purposed her to be, all that he wants her to become, all that's in her. I, I've learned something that when my wife is at peace with what God is doing in her, oh, my God, it makes me at peace, too. He he didn't have ears. Hear what I'm saying. So we want to, we want that woman to become all that God has purpose her purpose her to be, Amen. All right, so let's get into the lesson tonight. And I was going to try to post the notes. Let me see if I can get them out there quickly for y'all. Okay, bear with me one more second. Let's see. Come on, internet. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Lord. So first of all, I want you to go over to um, 
the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, and we're going to start out tonight by going over to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, and I'll give you a minute to get there as I'm still posting these notes for you brothers that want to um, be able to, to grab those and run with them. Okay. Amen. Proverbs chapter 24. And I want you to fix your attention on verse number 27. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 27. Let's listen to what God has to say to us here. Pre prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. Now, now, what is all that saying? First of all, brothers, you got to understand something. A lot of times, um, many of us as men, we're really in danger of missing what God has for us, that woman that God has purpose for you to have. We're in danger because we're not doing some things that we need to be doing. We're not being conscious of what's going on. We're in danger of missing her. Please hear me carefully. We're in danger of missing her. Yes, you might be married to her. Yes, she may not go anyway, but she may never be that person that God has ordained and purpose for her to be if we don't observe these things that I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay? So you can be with the right person, but that person is not the person she's going to become because you don't do what you need to do as a man. First thing off is one of the main reasons that we miss the woman that God has for us is that we have unrealistic expectations for her, and yet we have low standards for ourselves. Now, brothers, we're going to keep it real. Uh, most brothers want to want to marry a virgin when you ain't a virgin yourself. Yeah. Most, most brothers want someone that's pure and sanctified and holy and never dated, never kissed anyone, all that stuff. It sounds real good. But the reality is a whole lot of us have done a whole lot more and yet we have this low standard for ourselves, but we have these unrealistic expectations for her, okay? One of the things is we have to understand as men that there's a certain amount of preparation that we have to do to be prepared to receive the bride that God has for us, to be prepared to have, for that woman, that relationship God wants us to be in. We got to be ready for it. Not only do we have to be ready and develop, we need to have our, our finances together. We need to have our act together. Because, you know, one of the last things I, I remember when I was, when I was um, as the old folk would say, courting my wife, I, you know, I had my nice little Honda 626 with the oscillating vents, and I thought I was the man. I had a nice ride and all, but I was parking that car at my brother's um, house in Sumter at one point. I was parking that car at a deacon's, um, condo because I didn't have my own place at, at one point. And, and so here it is. I was projecting one thing, but I didn't have my stuff together. And even when I had my apartment with my roommate, Deacon Joe, um, brother was struggling. So here it is. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to put on this front like I got myself together, but I'm scraping pennies to get gas to go to Hopkins to go spend time with her because I hadn't prepared myself for what God had for me. Now, I, I know that maybe that ain't your story. Maybe you had it all together, but there's a certain amount of preparation God wants us to have to get ready for, for uh, the woman he has for us. Watch this. One of the key things is, and we'll go back to the scripture in a second. You can't, you're not ready for her if you still got somebody else on your mind. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Don't get ahead of myself. I'll come back to that in a second. All right. All right. So, Look at Proverbs 24, 27, but let's look at it from. Other translation. It says, plant, first plant your fields, then build your barn. What is this talking about? We want to build a barn when we don't have the field for it. You don't need a barn. If you hadn't planted a field and a whole lot of us, we are expecting increase. We are expecting productivity, but we have done nothing to prepare for it. Oh, yeah. You you sitting back waiting for something to come in. 
But have you planted the field? Have you put your crop out there? Have you sowed your seeds? Have you been kind? Have you have you done the hard work to get yourself ready? Have you paid them credit cards? Yeah, no, those things. Ha have you stopped whoring around? Have you given your life to Christ? I I'm not talking about you go to church because the, the devil goes to church. But are you truly serving God? Have you prepared yourself to receive the woman God has for you? Yeah. It's, we got some work to do. We got we got to prepare ourselves, brothers. All right, let's keep on that same vein. Let's go over to Proverbs chapter six. Proverbs chapter six, and look at verses six through eight. Proverbs chapter six, verses six through eight, and I'm going to read it from the King James version. Let's go. Now listen to the word. Go to the ant, you sluggard, you slack person, lazy. Not doing anything to get ready, wanting something but not doing anything to change, not, not working on yourself. Go to the ant, you lazy person. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provide her meat in the summer and gather her food in the harvest. But we'll keep reading. So the ant has enough sense to know what season they're in and to make preparation. So she provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Okay. So we have to prepare ourselves for what God has for us. And that woman, she's there. Now there's some of us, and let me, let me preface this. This teaching me, you may say, well, pastor, this ain't really wh where I'm at. Cause I don't want, I don't want to be married. I don't want to be, I don't want to date anyone. Again. And that's fine. Paul said, uh, you know, Hey, you know, being single, you can accomplish a lot more for the Lord. But we're talking about that woman because there may be they may come a time that you say, you know what, I, I want to be in a relationship again. And the Bible lets us know that this preparation has to be done. So you just don't pop up one day and say, Hey, you, you my wife. Come on, let's go get married. Let's go run to Vegas and get married. No, you got to prepare yourself. All right, let's keep going. So another reason that we miss the woman that God has for us, whether we're already married to her or not. Well, another reason is, is we have unordered steps in our lives. Our steps are not ordered by the Lord. We're just doing whatever we want to do. And so she never becomes the person that God has for us. She never fully reaches her potential. And yet, and I'm telling you, you can be married to somebody for 10, 20, 30 years. And yet you still have those same patterns where you don't, Allow God to order your steps, and you never, she never, you never realized the wife she could have been. I, I was talking to my brother Dante um, earlier, and I said, "Dude, I, I got enough sense. I married up. I, I married, I married someone that that had a lot going for him, and I married, I married Deidre not only for who she was at the time, but God, God gave me a, a, a glimpse of her potential, and I said, God, I want her today, but I really want her tomorrow." And that's what we have to understand, that we have to make sure that if that person is going to become who we want them to be, we got to get our steps ordered. And, 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 and I can think of some of the biggest fights me and my wife have ever had, arguments that we've ever had. We've never come to fish, y'all. Calm down. <laughs> but I can think of some of the biggest arguments we've ever had. And a lot of those things track back to the fact that I wasn't where I needed to be. Oh yeah, now now she now hopefully she ain't listening. She might go back and listen to this later. But the reality was, I wasn't where I needed to be. My steps were not being ordered by the Lord. Amen. And when they're not, it causes problems. Let's look at scripture. Go over to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Listen to the word. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So our heart does one thing, but God is the one who directs our steps. Let me give it to you in the message translation. It says, we plan the way we want to live, but only God makes us able to live it. Okay? So watch this. You can have all these plans 
You can say, oh, I want this loving marriage. I want this. I want that. I want to be, I want to date a woman that loves God and all, blah, 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 and all that's nice and dandy. But are you really ready for that? Are you really ready for a woman that loves God that's going to tell you, no, you're not getting none until we get married? Are you really ready for a woman that loves God that has a discerning spirit that, that knows when you're lying or when, when you're trying to be deceptive? Are you really ready for that woman that knows the word that doesn't intimidate you and that you can share time with each other because you're no longer intimidated by, by her knowledge of the word because you've been it yourself? When I first met my wife, one of the things that used to blow me away, this sister knew the word of God. I mean, she knew it up, down, and backwards around. And I used to be like, see, I, don't, I, I can't handle this. She always got a word for everything. You know what the Lord told me? Shut your mouth and get on your face and, and, and read and pray and learn it for yourself. And I'll never forget when I started having a conversation with her, and I, and I would know to a certain level, but when I started coming back with deeper revelation of the word, she like, oh. And so now that freed things up. So that now I was becoming the head of the family because not only was I the head by the scripture, but I knew the scripture. And so we have to grow. And we have to make sure that our steps are being ordered by the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 23 says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Let me let me pop, pop it up for you. Psalm 37 and verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. So. A good man, his steps, he not only follows what God says, but he loves doing what God says. Listen to what it says. Stalwart walks in step with God. His path blazed by God. He's happy. So I'm not just doing this to put on a front because God is ordering my steps. I love following God's way. I love doing what God wants. And I'm telling you, when you get to that place where you meet the woman that God has for you, she's not going to cause you to compromise the word. She's going to draw you closer to God because her heart is for God. And that's where you need to meet. OK, so next thing. So I, I tell people that are married, they say, well, Pastor, man, you know, I love God and my wife, you know, she kind of do her own thing, whatever. She go to church sometime or whatever. Well, you need to let that love of God um be contagious. Love her the way Christ loves us. The way Christ told you to love her in Ephesians chapter 5. And watch how it's contagious. Because you know what she wants? I want to I want to know why does he treat me so much better now? It's because of the love of God. And the more you draw closer to God, that is like a magnet. And she's like, man, I want that man. I want that man of God because he, he loves God and he loves me also. Amen. All right, let's keep going. So another reason why we sometimes may miss the woman that God has for us, I'm talking to married and single, is because we have limited vision. Yeah. We got limited vision. Now, I got four eyes. I got four. I call them four eyes. I got these glasses to help me see. And sometimes that still can be funny sometimes. Because the reality is, even though I got these glasses and they can help me see, but you know what? They only help me the most when they're clean, when they're clear. Oh, but when they get cloudy and when I get fingerprints and stuff in them, um, it makes it more difficult to read because now stuff, look the, the eight might look like a zero because of the smudge in my glasses. It's not that the glasses won't work. It's not that they're not helping me and facilitating um, the visual process. It's the fact that they're not clean. And sometimes our vision is limited because our heart ain't clean. Oh, my God. Sometimes our vision is limited because our, our thoughts are not pure. And so now I'm only looking for a physical attraction and I'm not thinking about a spiritual attraction. I, I'm only looking at her body. Oh, man, that girl. Fine, man. Let me tell you something. And let's keep it real, brothers. Um. Sometimes we can we can if we're if we're not the man of God that we need to be, if we're not prayed up and, and spending time with God and, and making sure that, that we keep our mind together, you will undress her physically, even though she got clothes on. Yeah. 
You, you, you ain't got to, don't, don't, don't put a comment. Don't, you ain't got to do all that. But the reality is a lot of us, when I'm, when we are looking just for the physical attraction, we look at, man, she's fine. Boy, she looked good with me, man. Man, I'll be able to say, man, bro, bros, man, my wife is fine. Yeah, but her spirit's foul. How can you be fine and foul? Well, there was in the Bible, there was a brother by, by the name of Eli. I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, yeah, Eli was a priest, but there was a brother by the name. Let me let me find it. Give me one second. Elkanah, thank you, Lord. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah, and he had another one named Panada. Panada was fine. Her name means precious stone, pearl, pretty girl. Uh, and she was very fruitful. She gave him many children. But the one he really loved, Hannah was barren. And she hadn't given him a child yet. But the Bible says he loved her that much more. Now watch this. He had the fine girl. Now, that, now it does. It never said, and the, the scripture never said that Hannah was not attractive. But it, it it keys in on the fact that Panina had it going on. Okay, she had it going on, but her spirit was foul. Here she is, um, tormenting Hannah, taunt her. Look at what you can't do. Look at what I can do. And that's how it is sometimes. Sometimes the finest thing look like it got it all going on, got everything going for him. Those fruit may not be the fruit of God. That might be foul fruit. And you got to be careful, brothers. You can't just run behind him because she looked good. See, the Bible says that I, <laughs> Bible says that we are the head and not the tail. And sometimes, brothers, what we end up doing, we end up chasing the tail instead of chasing the head. Yeah, we got we to gotta think differently. Can she meet you in the spirit? Can, can she meet you in the Holy Ghost? Can you sit down and have an intellectual conversation without touching her? Can y'all talk about what's going on in the world? Can she identify with your interests? Can, can y'all have an intelligent conversation and plan for the future? Can, can y'all talk about what's going on in the world outside of who said what and who slept with who? Because see, she's got to be more than that. Can y'all open the word of God and spend time together by just going through the word? Yeah, see, she's got to be attractive spiritually more so than she is physically. Because how many of y'all know some, some things that y'all, good God Almighty, you go back to your high school yearbook, pull it out, and you look at some of the people in there, and you're like, man, that girl was fine. Boy, she was bad. And, and you see her today, you're like, what the world happened? Because time brings on some changes. Oh, my God. See, the all of the Holy Ghost. God refines us. God makes us stronger. See, you may start at one level, but remember, we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We grow further and stronger in God. Though, though that physical body may be decaying and, and doing whatever it's going to do, we can grow richer and closer to God. And so you want to be with somebody that you don't operate with limited vision. You don't have fog all in your eyes and, and lustful thoughts. I see you, brother Darn. You got to be, you got to have your vision together. Okay. So let's talk about somebody that had this problem. When we look in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I'm not going to read the entire chapter because it is quite extensive, but let's, let's talk about 2 Samuel for a moment. 2 Samuel chapter 11. What's going on in 2 Samuel? Well, that's where we see a brother by the name of David. And what's, what is David doing so, that's so, so bad in 2 Samuel? Well, let, let's go there real quick. 2 Samuel chapter 11. You got your Bible, turn there with us. All right. It came to pass after the year was expired and at the time when the kings go forth to, to the battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah and David tarried still at Jerusalem. So when David should have been going out to fight, David stayed back at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening side, eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So David saw Bathsheba and she was fine. Y'all, King James, when it says she, she was very beautiful to look upon, homegirl had it going on. She looked good. She was fine. I don't know what they call it today, but in my time, we say she was fine. Okay. And the Bible says David sins and inquires after the woman. 
And it says, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah? Now notice what happened. When he asked about her, David was told from the, from the jump, hey, man, that's Eliam's daughter. And that's also Uriah, Uriah's wife, the Hittite. David sent messages and took her. She came in and, 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 and he lay with her. So even after he knew that that was another man's wife, David still pursued her. And brothers, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't play yourself. But how many of us have, have lusted after somebody else's wife? You say, Pastor, I ain't never done that. Well, well bro, why are you, why are you slobbering? Why are you, why are your mouth is all messed up when you're watching some of these people on television? That's somebody else's wife. Come on, brothers. And so the Bible says David got so caught up with the physical attraction, he, he could not even make a spiritual connection. Because that was another man's wife. And he knew clearly what the word said. So then in order for him to fulfill his lust, he ended up violating all kinds of spiritual principles. He ends up having a husband kill. Ends up sleeping with her. Ends up doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Because he was led with limited vision by how she looked instead of who she was. Yeah. Sometimes, brothers, we can't, we can't put our hands on everybody. That ain't yours. Yeah, yeah. So for those brothers out there that looking at somebody and say, boy, when you divorce your husband, I'm, I'm going to marry you. No, brother, that's not the way this thing works. All right, let's keep going. Go back to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. Praise God. Proverbs 31. Look at one verse, verse 30. Bible says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Let me give it to you in the message translation. Listen to what it says there, message version. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades. But the woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. So she, she may not be um, the knockdown finest thing to everybody else, but if that woman fear God, then you got something good on your hands. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And let's be real, brother. Sometimes your wife is a whole lot more beautiful. That woman you with is a whole lot more beautiful than you realize, but you just got to get the mop head off her. You got to stop treating yourself better than you treat her. Yeah, I said that. I, I have a rule. How dare me drive a nice vehicle and have my wife in a hoopty? How dare me dress nice? And then my wife got to scrounge and, 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 and figure out how she can put some clothes together. No, my wife is is like a crown to me. She is like, she's a representation of me. I want her to have the best of everything. And brothers, you ought to have, treat your wife the same way. You ought to treat your woman the same way. Even if you're not married, you ought to make sure that she knows she's valued. Now, understand something. The clothes and, and buying the things, those are not the things that, that give her value, but those are things that communicate. I dare not treat myself better than I'm going to treat you because you are my crown. Glory to God. You're my you, you're gonna be my bride. So we got to make sure we have our priorities together. All right. Now, also, you can be attracted to someone only spiritually, but have no physical attraction. And that ain't good either. That's how you get in situations where you love the person in the spirit, but you don't, but you marry them, but then there's no physical attraction. You still gonna have some problems. Paul said the word said that don't withhold sex from your wife and and the wife shouldn't withhold sex from the husband because your body don't belong to you anymore let me let me pull it up i, I feel y'all in the spirit talks about rendering due benevolence that means if she needs some you give her some and vice versa first corinthians chapter seven let's go there first corinthians chapter seven let's look at verse number three 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse number 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body. That does not mean for you to rape your wife. Let me put that scripture in context. 
your wife's body belongs to you, just like your body belongs to her. So now watch this. If you want her to take care of her body, how about you take care of yours? Because your body belongs to her. So if you want her to, to stay fine and work out and all, how about you do the same thing? Come on, brothers. We got to take care of ourselves, man. We got we got to be strong. Yes, I want my wife to look as fine and beautiful as she is today, 30 years from now. That requires her. If she tells me, hey, I want to go to the gym, I want to do it. I'm paying for the membership. I'm going to do whatever she needs to make sure she takes care of herself. But likewise, I got to make sure I'm doing what I need to do to take care of myself because my body don't belong to me, just like hers don't belong to her. All right. And so it says also the husband have not power of his own body, but the wife. Okay. Defraud not, ye not want one the other, except to be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves the fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. I speak this by permission, but and not of commandment. Let me go back and read that. Look at verse number five. Let me give it to you in the message translation. Let's get a little bit more everyday language. Message translation, uh, chapter 7, verse 5. Okay, actually, let me back up. Look at verse number 3. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife and the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Okay? Marriage is not a place to stand up for your own rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or not. Are out. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such times. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not understanding commanding those, those periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you so choose, if you choose, should choose them. So what Paul's saying here is, yo, man, um, you got to make sure there should be a physical attraction also to your bride. Okay? Now, watch this. If you're not married, you say, well, pastor, I'm attracted to her spiritually. I'm also attracted to her physically. Well, I'm going to tell, tell you in the words of, of many of a wise person, put a ring on it. There's nothing wrong with being attracted to her physically. But the scripture also says, that it's better for you to marry than to burn. So if you love her and you want to be with her, you want to you 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 are attract each other in so many ways. Go ahead and marry her so that you can honor her. The Bible says that marriage bed is undefiled. Do it in an honorable way. Amen. Sex is not bad. Sex is a is a blessing of the covenant that God allows between a man and a woman. Praise God. All right. So now we didn't hit that because some people think we're supposed to pray in tongues all the time and don't ever and don't ever come together. No, life will hit you with things that cause problems in that area. But the reality is, is that you got to make sure that you all are doing what you can do to make sure that you satisfy each other. Amen. Now watch this. There sometimes we miss the woman that God has for us because there's no intellectual attraction. I mean, y'all on two different planets from different places. Your interests don't cross. You can't have a conversation about anything. And, and brothers, and I've been here. There's been some people that, that I, I've been with in my past that the, at the one thing I can remember about them, we had good sex. What I thought was good at the time, it was sinful. If that's all you can, that's all that, that comes back to you, that probably ain't the person for you, bro. You already know because you're violating God's word. You got to be able to have communication and talk. And, and, and have intellectual conversation on many levels, okay? So let's go to the next part. Let's talk about this thing of being unequally yoked. And, I, and on the study notes, I put it down as the revelation of the unequal yoke. Let's go to the scriptures. We, we've heard these scriptures many a time, but let's go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, and let's look at verse 14 through 16. All right, let me pull it up. Here we go. 
Verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? Notice the contrast that's being made. It says light and darkness. Those are, those are opposites. And what concord, and just in case you don't understand the significance of it, what concord have Christ with Belial or the devil? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? Now, this, I believe that the scriptures have given us different ways we can be unequally yoked. Give it, let's, let's look at a couple of them. Okay. How would you, be, why would you yoke yourself? Now, what is a yoke? A yoke is what they would put on oxen. Um, they would put on them um, so that they can carry the load. They can move things forward. Hello, somebody. But it's hard to move something forward when that which you are attached to. Oh, okay. Okay, Lord, I hear you. When that which you are attached to is not even. You know, um, you ever been driving your car and you notice you feel like when you when you get on the highway, the interstate or whatever, and you get up to about 60, 65, 70, <clears throat> some of us, okay, a little bit more than that. And you notice you start feeling a little wobble and you start feeling it's because something is not balanced. Something is off. And see, you don't, sometimes you don't feel it. Oh my God. You may not feel it when you're going slow. You ain't doing nothing. Oh, but when you get ready to try to move forward and you try to pick up speed and you try to build momentum, then you start feeling the wobble. And then now your mind can't focus on where you're trying to get. You wonder, is the wheel going to fall off? Am I about to wreck? Because something is not even. It's because the load is not evenly distributed. And when you're unequally yoked, you're trying to get somewhere and you're trying to pick up speed and build momentum and accomplish things. And the person you with, they ain't with you. They're unequally yoked to you. Well, here it is. You're trying to set a certain pace and they're dragging. And so now, not only are you trying to pull the load behind both of y'all, but now you're trying to pull the person along with you. And y'all, it's a sad thing. When you feel like you're in a relationship and you got to pull the load, you got to, you feel like you're pulling the weight. You got to do it all yourself. That's a sad place to be in. Okay. So some of the ways you can be unequally yoked. Let's look at them. Go back to the scripture. Um, with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? Here it is. You trying to live for God and you dating a heathen. Well, I'm going to get her saved. The devil is a liar. Here it is. You trying to live for God. You you believe in prayer, and here it is. You say, "Well, I'm trying to live for for God. I believe Christ is the, is Jesus is Lord to the glory of God." And here it is. You dating dating somebody from a whole nother religion, somebody that's that's serving an idol. Well, she don't really go to church, but she fine. I like her. I love her. No, brother, don't be unequally yoked. And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have the devil with Christ? And what part have he that believeth with an infidel? So I take that part even further. When they talk about a believer and an infidel, obviously they're talking about someone of faith and not of faith. But let's talk about someone that believes in what you're trying to accomplish. Why would you yoke yourself with somebody that don't believe that God can use you to do anything? Why would you yoke yourself with somebody that always tears you down? It always calls you a nothing. You're a failure. You're stupid. You'll never be anything. And then you want to turn around and marry that person? And you think that putting a ring on that finger is going to make it better? Got a load of signs, my brother. Don't be unequally yoked. Okay? Let's keep going. Let's look over at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. Listen to the word of God. Now, this is in cases where the person you already married, okay, you say, well, Pastor, I'm already married, and yeah, I'm saved, and she's not saved, or she's saved, and I'm not saved. Let me help you out. This, this will bless you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. Listen to what the word says. Um, I'll back up and read into it a little bit.
All right, starting at verse number 10. For unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So if you marry and your wife doesn't believe and you believe or you or she she believes and you don't, don't depart from her. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Paul said, now this is me talking. I'm going to give you all some wisdom. Paul said, this is me talking. Listen to me. He said, if any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him put not her, not her let him not put her away. And the woman... W- and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, uh, let her not leave him. Why does Paul say this? Keep reading. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. And a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God have called us to peace. For what knoweth thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? In other words, what Paul said, now if you got married and y'all weren't y'all weren't equally yoked, don't just leave out of that. That's the easy way out. Paul said, stay there if you can, and witness to them and love on them. Conduct yourself in such a way that they want to serve your God. Who knows? You might end up causing them to come to Christ. And I've seen people take that scripture and say, well, see, Pastor, the Bible said that if she ain't saved and I love her, um, she might get saved when we get married. That's not what he's saying. He's talking to folk that are already married. But he already just told you, chapter back, yo, man, don't marry somebody that's not a believer. Don't marry somebody that does not believe what you believe. Don't be unequally yoked. Okay. I think y'all got it. Let's keep moving. Let's go over to the book of Amos, chapter 3. Amos, book that Dr. Martin Luther King would often quote from, especially when he talked about there being justice and peace. Glory to God and mercy. Hallelujah. Amos, chapter 3. Look at verse number 3. Just one verse. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can you really walk together and accomplish something? With that woman you so want to be with, if y'all not in agreement, she don't agree with your spirit. She don't agree with your God. She don't agree with your career. She don't agree with your interests. She don't agree with anything about you. Watch this. You have children out before you got before you met her. She don't want to have nothing to do with your children. How can she be your wife? Because the Bible says the two become one. So now she got to understand, just like you got to understand, brother. If you dating someone that already has children. When you, if you marry that person, those children become yours also. I, I am so fed up. I am so fed up with seeing situations where people marry and have blended families, and they act like this is mine and this is yours. No, brother, no sister. When y'all come together, you become one. That means those children, the the, the rearing responsibility for them, you become one. You got to do this thing together. Amen. So. If she's not on your wavelength, she's not connecting with you, she don't support, she's not in agreement with the things you're in agreement with, how are you going to marry that person? I know we think we the super, we, we Jesus Christ superstar. You're not. God tells us don't do it. The woman that God has for you is going to line up with the word of God and the will of God for your life. If that person does not, leave them alone. Okay. Now, if you're married to him already, pray. And ask the Lord to work with you so that that person can become what God wants them to be. All right. One more scripture in this area. We're going to move on. I think I didn't make the point. Proverbs chapter 25. Look at verse number 24. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a wide house. Now, let me give you out of that another translation. Yeah. Talking about being in agreement. Talking about the woman God has for you. Paul, or not Paul, but Proverbs says, it's better to live alone in a tumble-down shack than share a mansion 
with a nagging spouse. Nobody want to be married to a nag. I didn't say a hag. I said a nag. Nobody. I mean, come on now. We, we my wife, like you got a spot there, and I'm like, I don't want to hear that. She right. I got a spot. I got to get it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone that constantly, constantly, always undermines and harps on everything, always pointing out your failures. When you did this, you didn't do this. Constantly badgering you with stuff. Nobody wants to deal with that. So if the person's doing it to you like that when you're dating them, what do you think is going to happen when you get married? There's a woman that God has for you. But you got to know how to identify her. Praise God. Let's keep moving. All right. All right. Another reason we might miss the woman God has for us is we don't renew our mind from past relationships. And that puts an unfair weight on the person you date now. Now, she can't be herself. She got to try to be somebody you used to be with. Well, ask yourself the question. If God wanted you to be with who you used to be with, why did he? Why are you in this relationship you're in now? We got we to gotta take that weight off of people. And stop and stop making them try to be something they're not. Allow, look, when you come to a relationship, you gotta you gotta be whole in yourself and say, you know what, uh, this is what I offer. This is who I am. I'm not gonna change myself to be somebody else. Now, I know, I know the last person you was with, they had long hair and all. My hair's short. I ain't wearing no wig. I ain't wearing no weave. I, I'm gonna be who I am. Okay, this is what I like. Take it or leave it. Okay. We got to stop putting that weight on people. Give you a couple of things. It even shows up in the marriage bed. So, so now you're married to someone and your mind is still set on the, the freak you used to have sex with all the time. The one you used to run with. Remember I told you sometime if there's somebody, all you remember is how good the sex was. Okay. So if you don't get your mind renewed, if you don't get that, that stuff out your spirit, You'll carry that into your marriage bed, and now you got your wife. Turn here, do this, do that. Turn around, do this, and, all. and your wife like I, I'm not comfortable with all this. It's because you want her to be something you used to do, and that's not who you married to. That's not who you with. Now, can I keep it real, brothers? I mean, we're supposed to be brothers on here tonight. All right. So we gotta free ourselves from having these. These expectations that the person God has in our life now is going to be the person we used to be with. Okay. Now that comes in many different ways. Sometimes that could be because the person died that, you know, you might've been widowed. It could be something happened or whatever. Um, there are many ways, but the reality is if you believe that this is the woman that God has for you, allow her to be the person God made her to be. Amen. Allow her. You remember when, when, um, Abraham and Sarah, um, they couldn't have a child. And so Sarah took her um, her handmaid, Hagar, and said, hey, come come lay with my husband and give him a child. And, and so she produces Ishmael. And God says, looks at him and says, okay, yeah, but he still ain't the firstborn. He's not the chosen. He ain't the one. Yeah, he, I'll bless him. I, I, I'll, I'll set him up. But he ain't the one. Because God says, no, um, I'm not going to allow you to try to make something for me. I want you to be the unique. I, I know exactly who you are. I have the uniqueness of, of Isaac. That's who I'm calling for. And so if God puts you with Isaac, stop trying to make Isaac Ishmael or stop trying to make Ishmael Isaac. Be content with who God has you to be. Amen. Stop putting that weight on people. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to them. You wouldn't like it if if, if your name is 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 um Rick. I don't know that he's Rick. If your name is uh, Rutherford and and you meet um, and you date somebody and she was married to um, Stephen and she said, no, kiss me like Stephen did. Hold me like Stephen did. You'd be like, look at one. What you talking about? It's the same thing. The same way you don't want that coming at you. Renew your mind so that you can receive what God has for you in your new relationship. Amen. All right. That fella had to sit there for a moment. Who Jesus, the next one. Okay. Sometimes we miss the woman that God has for us because we still suck at a mama. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, that's why I actually wanted your mind to go too. Yeah. You can't be with your wife if you still sucking on mama. He to have ears. Hear what I'm saying. Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. 
And I want you to look at one verse, powerful verse, talking about Hannah. I alluded to her earlier. Hannah had this child named Samuel. And Hannah realized that she had made this vow, this Nazarene type vow over his life, and realized that she had dedicated him to the Lord. Hannah realized that there was a point for him to walk in his destiny, for him to accomplish the will of God for his life, for him to walk in his calling, to be the man that God called him to be. Hannah realized that she would have to let him go. Okay, let me show it to you. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22, I'm going to read it in the Message Bible. Bible says, I'm in the book, y'all. Hannah didn't go. She told her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll bring him myself and present him before God, and that's where he'll stay for good. In other words, Hannah said, after he, after he gets off my breast, huh, then I'll take him to the Lord, and he can walk in what God called him to do. And brothers, you got to make up your mind whose breast you're going to be on. Is it going to be your bride, your wife? I did say wife, not your girlfriend, your wife. Are, are, you, gonna are you still sucking on mama? Don't ever disrespect my mama got you where you are. But there comes a point that your wife has to be first. That she can't, she can't have to run everything through your mama. Now, I know some of us can say, well, I'm a mama's boy, Pastor. You don't understand. Yeah, but you got to have mama. I praise God. And those, and I know some mothers might be listening. Heed Hannah's advice. Prepare your child. Wean him. Yes, allow him to suck. Nourish him. Build him up. But you also got to wean him. And so some of us brothers need to be weaned. We got to be weaned. Oh, my God. You want to be a giant. You want to be used mildly by God. But you hadn't been weaned yet. You know what weaning does? That meant that that uh, Samuel had to get off his mother's milk. And there's another spiritual weaning a lot of us got to do also. According to Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 6, I believe it is, it says we got to be weaned from just being on milk. And we got to move to meat, the meat of God's word. Let me go ahead and go there. I hear you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So many brothers, we own, we own milk. So, so, and I know a lot of us are deacons and pastors and preachers and all, but we still own milk. We stuck saying the same stuff, doing the same thing. And we wonder why we not meeting the person God has for us because that woman wants somebody that's moving forward. She wants somebody that can handle the deeper things of God. Here it is. You go to church and you see her and she see you, but you never lift your hands. You never praise God because you still weaned on all I got to do is come to church. You still sucking on that milk. But oh my God, when, when, when you realize the meat of God's word, it'll make a praise come out of you. You never, well, pastor, you know, I'm a man. I don't do all that running and shouting. No, brother, let me tell you something. We got to grow. We are, should be growing our relationship. Just like you grow in your knowledge in school and academia, you ought to be growing in your walk with God. Your praise ought to be growing. Everything about your walk with God ought to be getting higher and higher. How it is, you still giving God patty cake, and here she running laps and, and giving God praise, and she going all the way in, and you sitting there telling me, hallelujah. The devil is a liar. You got to grow in that also. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I got off on a tangent. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Okay. Go to verse number... 12 Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 Listen to the word For when the time that you ought to be teachers you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and become as such as have need of milk and not a strong meat You see when you hadn't been weaned you can't handle nothing but milk Oh, but when you've been weaned, you didn't been through some stuff. Mama didn't separate you. Now you're ready to handle it. Because you know what? The Ephesians tells us that you got to nourish your bride. You got to wash her with the water of the word. You can't wash her with the water of the word and you're on milk. You got to grow, bro. You got to be stronger. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. So you got to be weaned. You got to stop sucking on mama. 
so you can receive your bride in Jesus' name. He that have ears, read between the lines of what I'm saying, but ain't saying. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> you will never um, um, have the woman that God has for you if you won't submit to God. If you will not submit to the will of God. Notice that Adam in Genesis chapter 2, Adam was doing what God called him to do. He was naming stuff. God was bringing stuff to him. He was naming it. But then God said, it's not good for, for man to be alone. So God created one man as he was working, as he was submitted to the will of God, as he was walking in the midst of the garden, as he was doing what God called him to do. God allowed him to go to sleep and brought Eve out of him. See, the person that God has on those Thank you, Lord. The person that God has for you is already attached to your purpose. Oh my God, you carrying around purpose and destiny and a plan that God has for your life. And God literally has attached that same purpose and destiny and plan to the person that God has for you. Let me tell you something. When I met my wife and, and she was a single mother and she was on fire for God, she was a church secretary and all. I didn't just see where she was. I saw my first lady. I saw my bride. I saw the one that would be teaching like I am right now. I saw the one that was a demon slayer. I saw the one that would be able to walk through life with me and go through trials and tribulations. And though people didn't understand her and, and oftentimes don't understand me either, I saw someone that I could meet in the spirit and we could go somewhere in Jesus. That's what you need, bro. You don't need somebody to look fine today and going to be tripping on you tomorrow. You need somebody you can grow in the grace of God with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But that requires you to submit to the plan of God. If you're not doing what God called you to do, how he going to pull it out? You want, you want somebody to come out to do what you're supposed to do. But God says, no, as you work, I'll provide for you what you need to accomplish the will I have for your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Calm down, Patrick Harvey. Next reason sometimes we miss our, our woman, the woman God has for us, is we get desperate. Man, everybody else got somebody. Why well, ain't got nobody? So now we start getting desperate. And now we start selling for everything. Well, she's breathing. Well, you know, you know, it's like if you're hungry enough, you eat almost anything. Some of us have certain things we don't eat. We're like, no, I don't eat that. But let life slap you and you're hungry. You'll be surprised what you'll eat. Likewise, when you get desperate and you start getting anxious and you start getting fretty and don't want to wait on God, you'll settle for anything. You'll settle for somebody that, that know how to pray, but don't pray. You'll settle for somebody that go to church three or four times a year and fully knowing you go every Sunday. You'll settle for somebody who, who will tell you, you got to go back to church again. And then you stop coming. Because you settled for that because you were desperate and you felt like that's all you could have. Oh, but when you know your worth and you know your value, you understand that God has a perfect person. He's already prepared for you. And it's up to you to walk in the will of God and find that person. Glory to God. He'll bring them to you. You got to be discerning to know who they are. Hallelujah. Here it is. You got to stop entertaining counterfeits. Stop entertaining the counterfeit. So many brothers get off track because we just want anybody. And so we settle for a counterfeit. We, we settle for somebody that, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But, but you know good and well, their fruit don't line up with what they say on Sunday. That's a counterfeit, y'all. I believe when we look at Judges chapter 16, Samson and Delilah, I believe Samson, Bible says that he loved her. But really, I believe he just lusted after her. But the Bible said he loved her. But it never said she loved him. And that's what the counterfeit is. The counterfeit often wants what you have. The counterfeit wants what you can give them. But they don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to go through. They, they're not going to be around when you don't have a house, when you don't have a car. I remember times when, when I was even passing early in my pastorate where a car would break down. And my father-in-law was a repo guy. And I would have to try to drive whatever car he had available uh, for the few days he had it because we didn't have no other transportation. And you know what? My, my wife got in the car with me and we laughed about it all because we knew it wouldn't always be like that. Glory to God. That wasn't the counterfeit. 
that was the one that was going to be by my side even when things got tight. That's what you need, bro. You need you need a warrior with you. You don't need somebody that's going to look prissy all the time. You need, you don't don't settle for the counterfeit. Settle for what God has for you. A lack of sensitivity to your surroundings. Now for this one, I got to go to Ruth. I want you to look at Ruth chapter two, book of Ruth chapter two. Let's look at a couple of things. Ruth chapter two. Now we know the story of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth had a husband. Her husband got sick and died. Uh, she came back to um, to to God's land with with her mother in law Naomi, um, and Ruth. Basically, she was a Moabite. I believe it was. I think it was Moabite. Yeah, and she cleaved to her mother in law. At some point, she finds herself working in a field. Okay, she finds herself working in a field, and we're gonna pick it up right about there. Uh, Ruth chapter two, verse one. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's. Now, a kinsman, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and, hap, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Okay? So watch what happens. So Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going to go in the field and work. Naomi says, go in the field and work. And as she's working, she's working in a field. Oh, my God. She's working in a field helping support helping uh, bring more value, helping gain more for a person she hadn't met yet. But watch what happened. She happens on a part of the field that belongs to Boaz. Boaz being her kinsman redeemer. I don't have time to get into that. But basically, if, you're, if your husband dies, someone from that line, from that family, had to had the opportunity to redeem you and marry you and, and give you and give you children and all. It goes on and on. We'll get to that later. At another time, but let me stay with the story for now. And so the Bible says that Boaz comes across and sees her. Where does he see her? Notice that Boaz sees her as he's handling his business. He's checking on his field. He goes to check how things are going in his field. And as he goes to see how things are going in his field, he comes across Ruth. He comes across who would be his bride the woman that God had for him. Ruth comes across the man that God has for her because he's handling his business and she's working in the field. What are you missing because you're working in the wrong field? Sometimes, my brothers, you need to handle your own business and God will cross paths with people that work in your field. You ought not want to be with somebody that ain't willing to work in your field. Yeah, Boaz met Ruth because she was working in his field. Are you trying to connect with somebody in somebody else's field? And now you wonder why they don't ever see the things the way you see them? It's because they're in the wrong field and you need to be looking for somebody in your field. Okay, please catch that. I wish I could really get into that, but just catch that and we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boaz was handling his business. And notice what Naomi told, told Ruth. Let me let me find it real quick. Powerful. Notice, notice what Naomi told Ruth in verse number eight. Then Boaz unto, then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. I'm sorry. In another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast in my maidens, by my maidens. Let not thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So Boaz put a hedge around her. Boaz protected her. Boaz said, I, I want you to stay in my field. See, you notice what he's doing? He's already providing for, now yeah, Boaz told, my notes are wrong, 
Naomi did tell her, Boaz saw her stay in the field. He's already providing for her, and she ain't even his wife yet. He's already making provision for her, making sure that even though she's still working in his field, she's putting favor on him, on, on, on her. Boaz is putting favor on, on Ruth, even though she's still working in the field. He puts a hedge around her, said, if nobody get anything out this field, make sure she gets taken care of. Brothers, if you want the woman God has for you, you're going to have to be willing to show her you love her before you marry her. You got to be willing to show her that you can take care of her. Now, I'm not telling you pay her rent, pay her car, pay her all this. I'm not saying that. But I'm, what I am saying is you got to be willing to build a hedge around her even before you marry her. That's what Boaz did. Okay. All right. Let me move on. The woman God has for you is a gift from God to assist you in accomplishing his will for your lives. So if you want your bride, the one you already married to, to be all that God wants her to be, you got to start treating her like she's a gift instead of a burden. Stop treating her like she's the packaging to the gift that needs to go out with the trash and start treating her like the gift she is. If you can treat her like a gift before you marry her and you can continue to treat her like a gift when you marry her, then she'll be the gift that keeps on giving. Oh my God, he didn't have ears. You got to celebrate her as a gift from God. And the Bible I read from says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And there's no variable, no shadow of turning in. I'm paraphrasing. God says treat her as a gift because that's what she is. Almost at the end. God has called you to hold her and help her bring healing and wholeness to her. God wants you to hold her and bring healing to her. Build her up and set her apart through the word of God. Now, Ephesians 6, Ephesians 5, 26 talks about how we are to sanctify our wives with the washing of the water by the word. That simply means that you ought to build her up. You ought to edify her. You ought to make sure she gets what she needs to grow in the things of God. And you got to be sharing some word with her also. You want to see, you want to see a woman that will submit to you. I'll show you a woman that sees her husband pray over her. Pray over her. And when you pray, pray the will of God for her life. Don't just pray she be by your side to help you. Pray the will of God be manifest in her life. I'm telling you, God will do mighty things in that woman's life and in and, and your life as well. All right. And God has also called us to support them and encourage them. I'm going to end with Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 26. Ephesians 5 and 26. Listen to the word. Back up and read into it. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You want to see your wife become all she's supposed to be? That woman, I told you she ain't, she not may not be all she's supposed to be yet. It's up to you to help her get there. Love her like Christ loved his church. Take care, provide for her. Share the word of God with her. Pray over her. Strengthen her. Encourage her. Pick her up when she's down. And watch how God continues to evolve her into the woman that he has for you. I pray that this has been a blessing to you tonight. I pray that the word has been, been a blessing to you. I know God's word is sanctified and a blessing all by itself. Thank you so much, brothers, for joining us tonight. As we get ready to close out, I want you to take a moment and think about your life and where you're at. Are you really the man of God that God's called you to be? I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm talking about being a man that loves God. Are you really saved? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you made him the Lord of your life? If I'm talking to you and you can't answer that question, yes, I'm saved. Maybe you say, I'm not sure. Maybe you say, I, I've never confessed him as my Lord. I want you, my brother, tonight to do the best thing you could ever do in your life. I want you to give your life to Jesus. Pastor, how do I do that? I want you to simply put in the comment section, Pastor, I want to be saved. If you're watching us on the website, I want you to send me an email. 
And I'm going to give you the email address. It's prayer at jbchopkins.org. And I want you to let me know. Say, Pastor, I want to be saved. Give us your phone number or your contact information. And we're going to reach out to you. And we'll connect with you. And make sure that you find a church that's going to help you grow in the grace of God. If you're not, if you, if you're not in our area, if you, if you feel that somewhere else is where you need to be, fine. We just want you to be saved. Glory to God. If you're listening tonight and the Lord has put it on your heart to become a part of the church I pastor, which is Jerusalem Baptist Church in Hopkins, I want you to put in the comment section, Pastor, I want to join JBC. I want to join JBC. And I promise you, I'm going to reach out to you and we're going to celebrate together. If you out there, brother, and you're listening and you know you love God, but you kind of strayed away and this teaching has punched you in your gut. You're like, wow. I got to do better. I'm expecting something that I'm not even myself. And you want to rededicate yourself to the Lord. My brother, all you got to do is put in the comment section. I rededicate my life to Jesus. I rededicate my life to Jesus. You guys have them words say, I want to reconnect with Jesus. Glory to God. And I promise you, we're going to connect with you as well. Praise God. If you have prayer requests, go ahead and pop those in for us. Amen. Thank you, Minister Douglas. Bless you, sir. Thank you, Brother Duran. Bless you. Amen. Let me pray for those that need to be saved. Father, in I pray, Lord God, that you would save, draw the law, Lord God. Draw them to you, God, in such a way that they come and they call out and cry out, what must I do to be saved? Lord God, heal and forgive them of their sins. Don't allow the enemy to snatch their lives. Don't allow the enemy to steal this moment from them. Lord, we pray now for those that need to be saved, that you would draw them to you even now as we speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need prayer for anything, pop it in the, in the comment section. We will take those prayer requests to the Lord. I want to thank you all brothers again for joining us. God bless you. Um, let's go to the Lord and for the benediction. And... We'll move forward. Y'all enjoy your weekend. Be safe this Memorial weekend. Don't just be all over the place. Be safe. Continue to be safe with your family. Um, if you have not been vaccinated, pray about it. Go ahead and try to get that done. Um, if you have not been, wear your mask. Follow all the guidance. This is not a time to let our guards down. We're still under this pandemic. It's still going on. We got to use some wisdom. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these brothers. I pray, God, as I let them go, that you continue to hold on to them, that you strengthen them, Lord God, that you give us wisdom and understanding and discernment, Lord, that you help us be the men that you called us to be. Strengthen us now for the days ahead and the journey ahead. Make us better fathers. Make us better husbands. Make us better leaders and mentors, Lord God. Make us better businessmen, better pastors and deacons and, and just men that love you, Lord God. Make us better at whatever our trade, our craft is, Lord God. We bless your holy name and your power being upon our lives. Now strengthen us now as we leave this time, but never your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray and ask these blessings. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless y'all, brothers. Remember, no matter what's going on in your life, God loves you. And it's time for you to man up. We'll see you next.